Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. All right, I'm back in the lab here with this Class D amplifier. It's a 420 watt amplifier per site. So what's rated for? Okay. Now, the way they can get that rating is each side has a TDA 8954 operated in a bridge type mode configuration. So instead of, you know, these chips are actually designed to put out a left and right channel or you can time in a bridge tide configuration and get more power and that's what they've done so they've got two of them on here that's how they're getting the power so in this video what I want to do is I want to run it through some paces and I want to see how much power we can actually get and how clean it is what the distortion looks like okay so I've done a video on this in the past but I spent a lot of time talking about the transformer power factor a bunch of that stuff this time I want to focus on this guy and see what it does okay so I'm gonna start off with this power supply up here and it's my GW Instec they actually make that Tektronix too <laughs> but anyway it'll put out about 31 and a half volts per side and about 3 amps maybe slightly more so I'm gonna run out of power but what I want to do is I want to first start off powering both sides okay so this video is really in three parts it'll be Part one is testing. I'm going to test both parts, both amplifiers, get as much power out as I can with that power supply. Okay, we're going to see what it can do. And really what I want to do is I want to see, I want to judge how big of a transformer, how many volts and what VA I actually need. Because I want to see what this guy can actually do. If it can handle that, if it can put out that power and put it out for a while, not shut down thermally or whatever, or have too much distortion, well good. Then what I'll do is I'll take the signal off one of the channels and just run the power through the other side. The other one will be powered but it won't be powering the load because it won't have an input signal. So I'll conserve all that power from that power supply to power just one side and I'll see if it can handle all that power. If it can then that's great. Then it'll give me an idea of what I need to do for the final power supply and I'll put it in a box like I did that class A 20 watt amplifier if you guys watched the series on that okay which by the way I'm not done with that uh, my buddy has it he loves it I can't get it back to finish it I need to finish some trim on the outside of the box and anyway he, he yeah he loves it so yeah feedback to you guys who watch that video uh, I've listened to it too it sounds great puts out lots of power but I'm going to get it back when I give him this one to test. Okay, so we'll put this in a box, give it to him to test. I'll get that one back, finish that video series. So what I'm going to do in the second part of the video is go through the spec. But in the first part, I'll use my thermal camera here to see how it's doing. And I'm going to use this picoscope in part three. So we'll look at the spectrum. You know, it's class D, right? So even, I'll put a one kilohertz sine wave in for test and on top of that one kilohertz we're going to see a little fuzz when we zoom in on that we'll see some switching frequency from the class D operation okay and we'll look at that with the picoscope and we'll see it, you can't hear it because it's out in the hundreds of kilohertz but it's there and yeah so we'll take a look with the picoscope that'll be part three part two we're going to look at the spec we're going to go through the spec all right talk about that see what the spec says about this thing so yeah there's your three parts. Okay? Hope you guys liked the video. Give a thumbs up if you do. That really helps the channel and the, the video because then YouTube will show it to other people. So, <laughs> so I appreciate that if you like the video. All right, guys? All right, let's jump into testing this thing. See what you think. And let me know. Give me your comments. All right, thanks, guys. All right, guys, this is the amplifier. This is one channel. This is another channel. This is the input power. AC input with ground in the middle and this is our input signal power the red would be on this side the white would be on this side the black is the return okay and then this is gonna be the fan power you can see the fan power right here for this one the fan power here for this guy and then we have our two chokes here for our output on this channel and our two chokes for our output on this channel okay alright so then Right here, 
I'll just show you the instrumentation. Right here we have our current probe. And I'll show you the current probe. It's just connected right up here to the power supply input right there. May as well show you the power supply. I turn it off because it's got a loud fan. But this is our plus, our minus, and our return. I've got it in a series mode, so uh, we'll be able to get a plus minus 30 volts just a little bit over that. So this current probe comes in, plugs in a channel 4 up here. Okay. Then we have a differential probe right here, and it's tied to this channel, so the, the Pintec. And then this differential probe is coming over here to this channel. Okay, so that's our instrumentation. And that channel is coming to uh, channel one, the one over here. And this guy is coming to channel two. And then this is our input generator. Right now I've got it set for 435 millivolts. Turns out that that's how I get that signal. I'm gonna bring it up and show you that signal coming up. And what we have here is left and right. Okay, so what we have here, uh, the two signals in the middle, here let me move the blue one down, see the channel two, differential probe this guy is the blue one, and we got 25 volts RMS, 25.39, and the yellow one is the other channel, 25.6, so slightly different, some uh, resistance values maybe, the tolerance, and then I just have them offset a little bit just so I can make sure I have both channels there. And then the green one here is channel 4. It's that current probe. And you can see it's 1, 2, 3 amps up. These other guys are 10. Both of the other channels are 10 volts per division. So 10, 20, 30, 40 volts up here. And the current's 1 amp per division right here. So it's 1, 2, 3 with about a half an amp peak, peak ripple maybe. I've got this frozen, but I'll turn it off and bring it up so you can just watch it. What I did is I maxed out the signal on the generator and got as much power I could on the left and right channel with that power supply. That's as much as I could get out of that power supply. All right, I had to get a new battery. Uh, let's come over here to the heel key. And the heel key is just reading uh, 20 millivolts, about whatever's left over on the power supply here. And I'm just using that to measure across from plus minus voltage. So the power supply up there should get about 31 half volts. So I should see 62, 63 volts here. And I just want to compare, uh, just to make sure I'm not losing too much across my leads. Just, alrighty. So we're gonna just uh, capture this screen here right now. And then I'm gonna go ahead and Try to recapture. I'm going to turn off the cursors, I guess. I don't even know what they're capturing. But yeah, here's our measurements 25.6, 25.39, and 3.04 amps. Now I'm going to unfreeze it, the screen. You're going to see it go down. And I'll turn on the power supply. You'll hear some power supply noise. I've got the power supply turned on. I'm going to just bring up the voltages. Let's see what happens. Okay, we have a little signal coming out 335 millivolts I'm putting in. It's giving us about 19.79 here and 19.59 there and 1.89 amps, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and pop it up another 100 millivolts and our power supply is, yeah, 31.6 on both sides and the heel key is 63.15, okay? All right, let's bring up the max power and see what happens or the max signal, okay? Now that's... Any bit higher than that, my power supply will start tripping. It's right there at the top. I can probably squeak out a little bit. And you can see the heel key is about 63 volts. And that's just about right. We're not hardly dropping anything across our leads because I'm getting about 31.5 on each output and 2.98 amps. At just at 3 amps, I start to uh, current limit. So I'll just go ahead and bring it up. 435 millivolts in, 436, and I'm at three amps on each one. I'm at 25.5, 25.76, and the next one, gosh, I'm still going up. 3.03, up oh, right there, I current limit. And so you can see it flat topping, it's current limiting. So, yeah, so that's a power supply issue, not the amplifier issue. 
then I have to bring it down a ways for it to uh, once it starts tripping you have to drop it down a little bit before it will uh, free itself so just to explain this ripple current here I've um, I put the peak on 742 milliamps peak to peak so just to explain that the uh, current the DC current it's the power supply is capable of holding that and it's got a little bit of ripple uh, that you know it's not capable of holding it completely flat so with the transformer input with bulk capacitors we also see a 60 Hertz component and if I slow this down we shouldn't see 60 Hertz from this power supply because it's pretty stiff but we do see that ripple right there okay guys uh, look at this thermal camera I like this thermal camera by the way Temperature down here is 50 degrees C, that's max. Men's 22.9, so 50 degrees max, 22.9. And the temperature over here is the one here in the center of the screen. And that is on the fan control. The hottest temperature is this fan right here. That's right above the one of the converters. And then you see the four inductors across the top. So this bar across the top shows the heat scale. The white's the hottest, the red next. So you see that white spot in the middle of the red? That's the hottest spot. So not bad at all, 50 degrees. Now the reason this one is the hottest because I have one of the loads, the 8 ohm loads right here that's kind of heating up that side of the board. All right, and this picture here shows uh, the 8 ohm load up here, the 8 ohm load over here. You can kind of see I had it a little too close to the board probably. And the max temperature is 71 degrees in this picture. And that is centered right on top of that load resistor. So you see the scale, the red, white, then the red. So you can see the board's red and the whites on these uh, resistors. All right, guys, that was pretty cool. We got some decent power. Uh, this guy is limited to three amps. That's kind of the problem with two channels. So we're going to do one channel to see if we can... Reserve all the power to this just to power one side see how many watts we can get. Okay, let's do it All right, turn off the yellow Trace because that is on the channel closest to the big load resistor on the other channel uh, We'll be able to run more current now just with one channel. So let's go ahead and bring up the signal Wow We got almost to the max before the top of the screen, right? Well, we're going off the screen, so okay. So I think I see where it's going right now. So let me bring it up and get it close again. Okay, that's 587 millivolts coming in, and we got 35 point, well, almost 36 volts on the output. Okay, let me move my signal up a little bit higher. Oh, yeah, I think that was it. 580. Eight. So let me drop that down. Once it crowbars, it, I mean, once it clamps, it kind of you have to pull it out of that. So it's uh, gone into protection mode. Okay. So that looks like that looks like the max power, thirty-five point nine, and that is due to voltage now, not current. Well, actually, no. It looks like it's a current problem again. My power supply is right at the cusp of current limit. Yeah. yeah, see the current limit? It's on, and we're right at 3.6 amps. And if I move them both the amps, now this one's a little bit lower, because this one's also powering the fan on this side. 31.6 volts, 31.6 volts, but the amps are a little bit higher on the positive uh, output, because that's where the fan's been powered. So, yeah, it looks like we're starting to current limit again. So again, it's a power supply problem. All right, guys, so let's take a look at the spec. What I want to show you in the spec is just, you know, what you can get single-ended. If you only have one of these devices and you're powering the left and right channel off one device, well, that's kind of what it's meant to do. But then also, if you use two devices like we have here, and each device you run in the bridge mode where you know your left and right channel is actually just your plus and minus on each speaker then you can get a lot more power 
and that's why this guy's rated pretty high in power. But it's also because of the 10% distortion thing. So, yeah, we don't want to do the 10% really. But then again, if you're playing music really loud, how much distortion can you hear? But still, 10% is clipping and stuff like that. So, yeah, we don't really want to get into that neighborhood. Let's take a look at the spec. I'll show you the single-ended and the bridge tide mode, which these are both bridge tide mode, right? So, yeah, let's take a quick look at the spec. Okay, guys, this is the data sheet from NXP. So it's the TDA 8954. And look, right here, they're saying 2 times 210 watts, Class D. This thing stayed in 2009. So it's been around for a bit. Now down here, what you'll see is it's two times 210 for a single device, and that's in the four ohms. So that's in stereo single-ended, okay? But in our case, we have a tied this way, mono bridge tied. So the two devices are tied together in a bridge, so you get 420 watts and eight ohms. And look at this, 93% efficient, in the four ohms, it operates over 12 volts, 12 and a half volts uh, to 42.5 volts. So for max power, you need to have this maximum voltage, which we probably, in my final thing, I don't think I'm gonna have that many volts. Today in the testing, we're gonna be about 31 and a half, so we're not gonna get there. Plus I don't have the current in my power supplies. And here's a table right here showing the power. See, here's the bridge tide load right here at the bottom. 8 ohms, 41 volts. So you need 41 volts just below the maximum. See the maximum right here, they're showing 42.5. Same as up here, so that's the max. But here's the features right here. Check out the features. Uh, differential input for BTL and single-ended, low noise, smooth pop noise-free startup, and switch off, so that's awesome. There's Diagnostics and protection circuits, fixed frequency internal or external clock. Look at the efficiency around 93%. It says zero dead time switching, so that's pretty impressive. And when you're not powering your amps, look at this low quiescent current, so that means it operates on very low power. When you're not playing music, it's not taking much power at all. And then it has advanced protection strategy, voltage protection, output current limiting, down here thermal fold back. So that's pretty cool. When it hits thermal, it doesn't just switch off. As it approaches the max, it starts to fold back and then it finally disables it. And it has a fixed gain for your single end of 30, but we're gonna be in this configuration. So we'll have a gain of 36 dB. Look at this, fully short circuit proof across load. So short circuit protection, that's awesome. So yeah, this is looking pretty good, right? Okay, uh, here's the applications it talks about. Home theater, possible high power speaker system, subwoofers, DVD. And here's the voltage rails on the spec. Here's the standby currents and stuff so very low current okay so here is the power single-ended that's what they told you above here's the how they break it down now this is with the total harmonic distortion plus the noise at 10 percent so yeah we don't want to operate there but these are the power levels right here they're showing 210 with 41 volts 35 volts 150 watts so we're gonna be in this model bridge tide load configuration and they're showing 420 watts. Now that's 10% distortion. So we don't wanna be there. Let's go look at distortion curves. Now, by the way, when you order this thing, it comes in two different configurations. We're gonna talk about that in a moment too, but on this board, we have two of these devices, the TH, the HSOP, 24 H SOP 24 okay otherwise known as a SOT 566-3 
You can also get in the through hole version. Well, again, we'll talk about that. Okay, here's a block diagram. Really cool. Now, here's one input. See the top shows one channel come through, the bottom shows another channel. Since we're bridge tied, basically we're putting our speaker right between these output one and output two. So when we're running and the signal is swinging, it's gonna go from VDD, our plus voltage is gonna get pulled up to there, output one, okay? And then output two can get pulled down to minus voltage. So we can go from plus voltage to minus voltage right across our load. So we can get double the voltage across our load by doing this bridge tied load, okay? Now take a look. Uh, this signal right here is to help the gate drive. Here's the input voltages across here. So here's output and input voltages right through here, okay? Come over here, here's some more voltage. Here's some stability protection circuits right here, okay? Now, over the input stage, you have your input VDD diagnostics, okay, for both channels. Now look at the inputs, input uh, minus and plus for the top one, oscillator reference, oscillator mode of operation, signal ground. And then for input two, you got plus minus. You notice what's kind of missing here? There's no feedback. There is feedback internally, but isn't that interesting? So no global feedback, that's pretty cool. Now, here's the pinning information. Here's how they're pinned out, the two different things, the through hole versus the surface mount. Yeah, look at the com pin configuration between these two parts here. Now, see this right here, showing the metal tab underneath this part? This chip is a lot larger, one on right. It's not just the scale of the picture, but they're actually, they're probably showing the scale pretty similar to what they are. So you might think you get more power out of the one on the right, but you can't. I'll show you that in a moment. Here's the pin, here's all the description of each pin. They go through an actual description right here. I'm just gonna scroll through this. Here's our bridge tied load right here. Here's a single ended. Okay, so here's one thing I wanna show you, pulse width modulation. This thing, you can set it up to operate anywhere from 250 kilohertz to 450 kilohertz. And it's showing you by setting a resistor, you can get this frequency range through here. Now here's the protection stuff. Talks about all the overcurrent, under voltage, over voltage, all this protection circuitry, pretty detailed. Thermal protection. That's what one thing I want to show you here is this thermal foldback. It's pretty cool. This right here is showing a picture of the thermal feedback, uh, how it folds back. So as it clicks on, you see the output, it kind of diminishes how much load you can get on the output to try to cool it off, okay? Here's a discussion about how it does that. Now when it actually does go in over protection mode, see this 100 milliseconds? That's kind of common with the other protection circuits too. They'll take it off, wait a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds before they try again. So here's a timing diagram for that. And this is over current protection discussion, talking about how you can filter, all that kind of stuff. Again, when you read the rest of this, they talk about this 100 milliseconds right here. So here's some information about short circuits and so on. And this is kind of the table showing how that works, where it starts to trigger and sets off the over current protection. And this talks about the window protection, talks about 100 milliseconds, uh, short circuit detected, and just goes into further discussion. And the power supply protection, again, 100 milliseconds. So even the clock has protection, and I'll just scroll through this so you can kind of see it. The diagnostics. Okay, this is a discussion of the differential audio inputs, comm mode rejection ratio, pretty impressive stuff. Here's a simplified diagram of how ours is connected with the bridge tied load.
this is our connection right here. So you can see how when this transistor on the top turns on, he pulls the signal up, the bottom transistor pulls it down. So you can get from rail to rail, plus rail to minus rail across your load. And then we have these inductors that you see on the board. And of course the capacitors, LC filter to signal ground. And here's how the inputs would be tied together. So the plus to the minus. So this way, when the signal goes up here, it makes this output positive and makes this one minus. So it turns on this top transistor and turns on the bottom transistor. Now here's the thermal information. Junction to case, this bottom one is 0.9 degrees per watt. So that's pretty good. And then 40 degrees per watt if in free air, no heat sink or anything. Since we have a heat sink with the fan, we're gonna be much better than that. And this is the frequency that you can set it up to operate in. So just wanna show you that table. So this is for stereo single-ended configuration. You can see the power right here. Now look over here on the left, see right here, 0.5%. That's in a four ohms, 160. So when you don't mind going up 10% distortion, then you go up 210 watts. Now this is for single-ended, okay? Let's just go look at our condition. In our condition, we have this mono bridge side load, okay? So we go up to 330 watts at 0.5%. And now this is with rails of plus minus 41. So we won't be going that high, but 10%, you, if you don't mind that, you can go up to 420 watts, and that's into eight ohms. Now, here's the one watt thing that's normally set up, one watt, one kilohertz right here, 0.03. That's normally what people talk about when they talk about distortion of an amp. And you see that's 0.03 to 0.1 max. Now, 6 kilohertz, they, they give you a, a different frequency here, and that's 0.05, so it goes up slightly at 6 kilohertz. This is, again, 36 dB. And look at this, power supply rejection. So if your power supply is causing some ripples, some noise, 100 hertz, 80 dB. 1 kilohertz, 80 dB. So really good power supply rejection from the ripple on your input. Now, just in case you want to do the math, here's the equation for the input voltage you're happening to use on your voltage rails and your load. You can use these equations to calculate your power. Max current is 12 amps. And so you can calculate this peak current with all your conditions right here. Now, again, this is single-ended, okay? We don't have that. Let's go down and look at our condition. Here's your bridge tide load. So here's the bridge tide load. If you want to calculate your IO peak, you can only, the chip will only let you go 12 amps peak before current limiting. So here's the equation. You put your uh, RDS on of your transistors, your load resistance, eight ohms or four ohms, whatever it is. The RS, that's the DC resistance of the inductors. Your frequency is switching. Put all these things in here and you come up with that, okay? Now, here's some information on heat sink requirements. You can go through this math. I'm just gonna scroll through it so you can watch. So essentially what this is telling you, that if you wanna dissipate 30 watts, if you wanna put out your max power, and you have to have this curve, you have to have, you have, to have a heat sink good enough to, that you only have five degrees per watt rise, okay? If you're only gonna put out this many watts, or dissipate, this is dissipation on this left side. So if you're only gonna dissipate, say, under five watts, then you can be almost free air, 35 uh, degrees per watt. Remember, free air was 40 degrees per watt. In this case, just a little bit of cooling, you can, and since it's mounted on a board and stuff, you know, yeah, you don't have to do much to get that kind of dissipation, that's five watts if it's 90%. That means you go about 50 watts without worrying too much. And there's the notes down below, okay? Here's the continuation of the notes. All right, guys, there's an example schematic of this chip. The input here, another input here. This is for single-ended. They're showing two different speakers. We have the bridge tide load. 
Okay, I'm gonna just scroll through this so you can take a look, but they're showing THC plus noise with across the power spectrum. This is 100 watts right here. So this is single-ended. Let's just scroll down to CRs. Here's another single-ended. This is with frequencies. This is with these three fre frequencies at 39. We're up above. It was with 41 volts, okay? All right, so here's the graph showing total harmonic distortion plus noise on the left. And here's point 0.1 right here, this 10 minus 1. So that's point 0.1 right there, okay? Now on the bottom, it's versus power. So over here, this is 100 watts right here, okay? Here's 10 watts, here's 1 watt. So you see, that's why people like to use 1 watt. It's just a standard number, but you can get pretty low distortion right here. And right at 10 watts, this graph number 2, which is 6 kilohertz, kind of has a spike. That's why they gave six kilohertz because their device shows a little more distortion at 6K, so that's why they showed 6K and 100 hertz. So they've got three different frequencies and you can see how it goes. So just above, and then as you go higher power, two, 300 watts, and then look at this, right around 300 watts, it starts to go up. So that 10% we're talking about is right up here, but look at this. This, how sharp that curve is after you pass, say, right around 300 watts. So if we keep ours down around 200 watts, we should be operating, you know, down here in the lower noise area. Now, here's the single-ended with four ohms. Now this one, instead of power down here across the bottom, it's frequency. So it's showing how flat it is across frequency, okay? THC plus N. And here's that point one line right here. So curve number three is 100 watts. And so 100 watts, you got a little bit more noise and it's, it's pretty low right through here, 100 hertz to 1000 hertz, okay? And then at 10K from 1000 hertz to say 2000 hertz, 10K it goes up a little bit at 100 watts. But 10 watts, it stays down here pretty low. So that's pretty nice. And same thing with the lower voltage, 39 volts. All right, this is our configuration, the BTL, and one, 10, and 100 watts. And curve two, 10 watts, look how low it is. So low. There's one kilohertz, 10Ks over here, and then it kind of goes up to about 0.1%. It has a peak right there, just below and then they all fall off because it has huge filtering after that. So the filters just kill all the, the noise. But even curve three, 100 watts, it stays under 1% until about three, four kilohertz. And then right around that six kilohertz has a spike and still it's below 0.2. 0.2 would be right here. Okay, here's your power. Um, right here on the left bar compared to how much voltage you put in. So let's say you have 30 volts, it's right here. Then you can come up here to 150 watts. You get 150 watts with 30 volt rails. Now, curve one is 10%. So, you know, it's weird right here. It says one and two, and then one and two again. I think that's a mistake. I think this is one and two and three and four because we have curves one, two, three, four. So 0.5%, you can't get as much power. So I think these right here should be labeled three and four. That's single-ended again, not what we're doing. So let's go look what we're doing. Okay, this is us right here, BTL. So 30 volts, you can go just over almost 250 watts. And that's 10%, so curve two is 0.5. So 30 volts, 0.5, you can get, well, what is that, 180 watts. That's pretty high for 0.5%. So if we go, I think we might end up around 35 volts just because of selection of transformers. So that means we go up 250 watts at 0.5 and 320 watts at 10%. So I think we're gonna be operating right around in here. All right, so the one thing I wanted to show you is between those two packages, see this 
thermo slug. The dimensions of this slug right here, for, for this guy here, it's pretty close. Well, it's almost exactly the same except for these tabs on the surface mount part right here. So even though this part's a lot smaller, it's, it's just can be smaller because the surface mount's got pins on both sides, but the I think the power components, most of, I think the die is on this metal part right here, which is the same on both. So I think that's why the power is the same on both parts. All right, guys, so one note about those uh, specs we just looked at. You saw the date, right? 2009, so wow, what, like 12 years old? Uh, good 12 years old, right? Now, that was in 2009. In 2006, NXP spun off of Philips. So if you know who Philips are, I mean, those guys have been doing audio stuff for a long time. I think it was them and Sony together that came up with the CD technology way back when, replacing records and so on. Anyway, Philips was played a huge part in that. I think they actually hired, or I don't know, I think they pioneered it and brought Sony along with them. Something like that. Don't know exactly the, you know, background on that, but just something to that effect. So Philips, Magnavox, they own Magnavox, and now Philips Semiconductor, at least, is NXP. So uh, that was 2009, that data sheet showed NXP. Now, these chips are really cool looking, but they're just MOSFETs. Now, here we are 12 years later, we should be going to GAN, right? With GAN, we should even be more efficient, get more power. And All right, so here, let's uh, turn on the power. I got the picoscope going, and I think it's gonna find the signal. Here, we don't have a probe in A. I'm gonna turn this guy off. I just have a probe in C. That's the only one, so there we go. All right, there's our signal, one kilohertz. Now, that's not maxed out yet. But you know what, here, let me bring it up a little bit higher. I don't want to quite max it out yet. Okay, there's our signal coming out. We're running along. Look at the peaks are right around there. Let's get a measurement on that. All right, we gotta go to channel C. Let's get the uh, measurement. Let's get RMS. Okay, cool, we got RMS down here. Let's get a frequency. There we go. Nice, one kilohertz, that's right. All right guys, so now that we got the frequency in that, let's zoom in on this window right here. Whoops, let's come over here. I wanna look at the class D part of the waveform. Wow, there we go. Let's get a little closer. There we go. I think I'm gonna have to freeze that. I'm gonna move this out of the way. We'll freeze that. And then let me get the cursors. I want to see what the frequency is there. Get that on one of those noise spikes. Yeah, let's get right there. Uh, look at that, 654. I think it's because we're getting the switching cycle on each amplifier, on each, you know, because we're bridge tied. So let's switch over, because I think that's above the range of these things are supposed to switch at. So right about there probably. Uh, maybe I'm gonna get it right in the middle of that waveform. It's kind of noisy at the spiky tops. Okay, I got it right about in the middle. I'm looking kind of the width of the waveform. Okay, so about 339 kilohertz is where I think each of the halves of the converter are switching. So yeah, we're getting 339 and then we get double that because we got both converters running that's pretty cool you know what let's go open up another window because we have a spectrum now here let's get that running again turn it on get live view there we go had to readjust and look at that that is way cool okay now i think what we have to do is come over here and hit, whoops, not that one. Where are we? Here we are, measurements, C. Oh, you know what? I think I know where we gotta go. We gotta come up here to uh, spectrum and get this. 
And then once we're there, now we change this. So this is our spectrum. See, we're looking at eight megahertz across the band. Let's stretch it out to, oh, look at that. Well, I can shrink it down and catch a few more spikes, but yeah, look at those spikes right there. Let's go see where they're, where they're happening. Okay, that one right there is 675. That's because of the two converters, right? And then there's another uh, harmonic of those switching frequencies. And there's the one. Yeah, there we go. There's the spectrum of it. Now we can come up here and, and just look at it. Oh, look at that. That is so cool. Let's spread, keep spreading it out. See, you know so single spikes kind of break out into multiples because you saw how noisy they were let's go down 20 kilohertz well there's a 50 kilohertz so this is all the way out to 50k look at all those little spikes down in here and our one kilohertz is i think this guy right here let's go to uh 20k now we're all the way out to 20k that's our audio spectrum and that's a full power putting out a bunch of stuff let's move this over verify that's our one kilohertz yep sure is now what the heck oh look we got bins oh we can get some oh wow look at that we can refine our bins we can change to wow any one of those guys i guess we'll stay with the blackman for now and look, it really slows down. Look, collection time, 3.3 seconds. That is so neat that it does that. Here, I'll speed it up a little bit. But you see how fine these little guys down here get. Wow, look, every 1.6 seconds it takes to collect all that. Here's the axes. Okay, Y axes, normal, average, or peak. That is so cool. Here, let's stretch out this window. I can bring it up here and I can make this window a big one so we can get a good look at that spectrum. Although, what I want to do, here, let me shrink a little bit because I want to come back up here and I want to look at this stuff here. Let's look at these axes. Oh, look, dB microvolts, dBm. Let's go dB volts. Man, I love this. This is awesome. Number of decades. Okay, that's pretty cool. I'm going to go five decades since we're going to... Oh, can I only... Oh, I can't change that. Oh, maybe I need to go log. Anyway, uh, let's go back to our waveform. Okay, view. I lost it. we got to come back over to our spectrum. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that is so neat. So there's our spectrum right there. Uh, let me drop it down to, there's 10K, there's 5K. I'm sure it takes a while to update. There's, is that one kilohertz there? Let's grab another cursor. There is two kilohertz right here. Is that two? Nope. That's two. I'm looking up here at this window. See, there's 2K right there. So there's the harmonic right there. This other stuff is some switching noise or... It's 1.87. Yeah, it's just some random noise, I think, here. Uh, yeah, I would have to search down and see where that's coming from. But yeah, that's pretty darn cool. And what's our, let's do some measurements. Oh, look at this. Let's do uh, THD plus noise. We'll do just THD uh, percentage wise. Let's do percentage. And then let's read the amplitude. There's signal noise ratio. We'll get a bunch of readings. Yeah. There we go. Look at that. THD percentage 0.31. Uh, THD. Oh, are these the same one? Maybe I hit that twice. 
Okay, there we go. THD. Here's THD plus noises, and that's in decibels. And this is percentage, 0.36. And there's our amplitude, 30 dBs. And it's been running for a while. It doesn't seem too hot to me. Ooh, except for the resistor's pretty darn hot. Well, that's pretty neat. Uh, right? I guess that's probably enough for today, but that is impressive. Look at that. As I turn down the power, it just kind of goes nuts. <laughs> that is cool. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, before we go any further, uh, give a thumbs up to the video if you like it. It really helps the YouTube analytics, which helps the channel. It's a free way to help the channel. And, yeah, it's just... Oh, and by the way, I have links for the board. And actually, the test equipment that I'm using here, I'm going to put together a list of links. That That's a free way to help the channel as well. Really appreciate that. And, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> Uh, let me know what you think of this project, too. All right, so what do you guys think of that? Hey, what do you think of the Pico? Uh, I snuck the Pico in here. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I'm just playing around with it, still learning how to use it. But anyway, it's really cool. And also there's brand new software, so still learning. All right, so what do you think of that? It does put out quite a bit of power. It's pretty impressive for the size of board it's on, right? I mean, that is pretty darn cool. Um, cool, right? <laughs> now, remember, right now, I'm, I wanted to get rid of the whole power supply stuff. You know, the toroid transformer, all that. I wanted to decide what size of toroid I need. So, I just wanted to use this power supply to get the most power I could. And hopefully, I was hoping to get enough where I could get a good idea about where I want to go with this and I think I have a good idea so um, yeah that was pretty darn neat I mean we got over 160 watts just on one side and that's just at 30 volts I think I'm gonna go where once we bridge rectify we'll get 35 volts what do you guys think let me know what you guys think I should do for a transformer how many VA you know 160 watts 90 percent efficient I don't need a lot so I was thinking even a 500 VA would probably be plenty, a uh, 35 volt. That way I can maintain, I can get enough power at the lower distortion levels where I think I can get what I want out of this board. What do you guys think about that? Let me know you, your comments and all that stuff below. Thanks, patrons. Two thumbs up to my patrons. Really appreciate you guys. Wow. Um, thanks for all you guys watching the videos, commenting, and so on. And... Let me know what you think about this amp. I'm going to put this together. So I need a transformer. I need to put together a power supply. I need to put it into a box I have down here in a, in a cardboard box. But I have a metal box to put this in. It's a nice little small amplifier. I'll show you that. And yeah, we're going to make an amplifier out of this thing. And we're going to go compare it to the Class A amplifier my friend has right now. Okay? Let me know what you guys' thoughts are. All that kind of stuff. Pretty darn cool amplifier. A lot of power. Efficient as heck. We don't have to worry about a lot of temperature. These fans are quiet. So even inside a box, I think they're going to be quiet. So, all right. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.